Hello and welcome back to another chemistry lesson with Mr. Andrews. Um, before we start, I just want to go over a couple things. First, we're going to be talking about the properties of matter, so early lesson in our first unit. Um, on the left side of my screen here, I have the worksheet that you will be filling out. And on the right side, I have the slides that go with this lesson. Both of these are posted together on the assignment. Um, I just want to clarify because some people have uh, had, I've had mixed responses to what's going on in this page here. Um, this worksheet is for your notes and also for your classwork. So as we go through the slides, there'll be places for you to fill in the definition of matter or fill in areas for your notes. Um, little areas where you can pause the video and do um, some kind of like independent interactive activity before moving on. When you turn this in, you will lose access to it momentarily until I grade these and send them back to you. When they're sent back to you, you can then store them in your Google Drive and keep folders of notes and all the materials from these activities. Um, if you don't want to um, lose access to this at all, what you can do before you turn the file in is you can hit file, make a copy, and that will make a new copy in your Google Drive that uh, I won't get turned into me, but you will have so that you can organize and keep your notes organized for yourself as we go forward throughout the year. Um, okay, so let's get into it. Uh, first couple days, we were really focusing on the math of units, significant figures, scientific notation, and things like that. And that really revolves around um, measurements, measurements of matter. And today we're really going to talk about matter itself. Why are these measurements important? So matter is a physical substance that occupies space and possesses mass. So it's anything that takes up space and consists of something. So that's air. That's the water in a water bottle. That's the water bottle itself. That is the towel next to me on the table here, this, this dish towel. That is my, the computer that I'm talking to you through. Um, everything that you can observe and feel takes up space and has mass. Um, everything that we can observe is matter. So what I want you to do is, oh, excuse me, uh, intensive properties and extensive properties are kind of how we categorize these observations of matter, these different senses that we have. An extensive property is a property that depends on the amount of matter that we have. And an intensive property is a property that depends on the type of matter that we have. So extensive properties will change if we have more or less matter. Intensive properties won't change if we have more or less matter. So what I want you to do now is I want you to pause this video for a minute and in your worksheet over here, I want you to just type um, as many intensive and extensive properties as you can think of using those guidelines. Extensive properties, property that depends on the amount of matter. Intensive, property that depends on the type of matter. Okay, so pause. And I'm going to assume that you paused for a minute and unpaused. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit. So um, intensive properties, properties that don't change with the amount of matter. So that's like, does this material conduct electricity. It doesn't matter if we have a ton of copper or a very small amount of copper, it, it's going to conduct electricity. So it doesn't matter if we have more or less, it's always going to conduct electricity. Things like, is it magnetic? We can have a lot more, uh, we can have a very large sample, or we can have a very small sample, but it doesn't matter, it's going to be magnetic no matter what. Think of another intensive property here while I'm sitting with you. Um, how about ductility? That was kind of inspired by my first idea here, if it conducts electricity. Ductility is a property that describes whether a metal can be spun out into long wires. So if something is ductile, it can be stretched out into long wires. Copper happens to be ductile, it has high ductility, and it conducts electricity, which is why it's used in electrical wires. Extensive properties, your properties depend on um, how much stuff you have, that's mass. If you have a cup of water and you have a bucket of water, they're gonna have different masses. They're both water 
and their intensive properties will be the same, but the amount that you have is different. So they will weigh different amounts. They will have different volumes. Um, these are really the big ones when we talk about extensive property, and there's more out there, and we'll explore them more as we go on and have more opportunities to do some uh, to dive deeper into this. So when we identify substances, we use their properties to do this. So a substance is matter that has a uniform and definite composition, and we categorize matter into substances based on its properties. So here, a big key idea of the day is that every sample of a substance will have the same intensive properties. So like I just said in the previous slide with water, if we have a cup of water and a bucket of water, they're both water, they both look, taste, smell the same, but there's different amounts of them. So we use the intensive properties to categorize our substances. So when it's important to remember, when we talk about intensive and extensive properties, both physical properties, we're talking about things that can be observed and can be measured without changing the composition of what we're looking at. Um, for example, the, I'm just going to make a little quick note here. When we say changing the composition, that's really looking forward ahead to the next lesson about chemical changes. If we put a substance through a chemical change, it's no longer the same substance, so we're not observing and measuring the same properties, and it will be categorized differently. For instance, a physical change like with sneakers. You get a fresh pair of sneakers. Over time, they wear down, they get dirt from the sidewalk, they get grimy, and will they still serve the same function? They're still a size 11 sneaker. They look different. They've accumulated dirt. They've worn down a little bit. That's a physical change because they're still the same thing. A non-physical change would be like if you took those sneakers and you lit them on fire. Yes, initially they still look like sneakers, but when you're done burning that pair of sneakers, it, they're no longer sneakers. That's a pile of ash. It's a different substance. It's not the same thing. It has different properties from the original thing that we were looking at. So let's practice with the in, um, intensive and extensive properties by actually examining a couple substances. So on the left here, we got an image of uh, gold. And on the right here, we have an image of copper, pure gold and pure copper. Um, what I want you to do, if you scroll down our notes over here, we've already covered the first page, and you have this table here. So again, I want you to pause this video, and I want you to take a couple minutes to look at your reference tables and fill in as many intensive and extensive properties for copper and gold as you can find. You notice the hint here is table S. All right, so hit pause and go do that. Okay, so I'm assuming that you hit pause and now you're back. If we go to the reference tables and we scroll all the way down to table S, all the way down here, it's sideways. Let's see if I can rotate this bad boy. Here we go. Let's find copper and let's find gold. So copper is element number 29. I'm going to highlight the row here. Okay, so these are all intensive properties, or excuse me, not all intensive properties. Um, of copper. So we can notice things like uh, first ionization energy and electronegativity. I haven't told you that yet, but let's look over here like melting and boiling point. Melting point, 1358 degrees Kelvin. If we take copper and we melt it, it's still copper. It just went from a solid to a liquid. That's just a physical change. It's still the same thing. And if we cool it down again, it will again solidify back into solid copper. That's how we get um, metal in different shapes. We have to bring them above their melting point, put them in a shape that we want, and then bring them back down below their melting point so that they harden into a solid again. So for copper, let's put copper on the left side of the table, intensive property, it has a melting point of 1,358 degrees Kelvin. Whoop, Kelvin. For gold, gold is element 79 down here. Gold has a very, very similar melting point. It also has a melting point of 1,337. 
that is pretty close to our melting point of copper. And it turns out that copper and gold uh, are similar in a lot of ways. Um, intensive properties, you know why they're similar? They also both conduct electricity really well. So I'm going to put that one down for gold, but I'm also, oops, I'm also going to put this down for copper. So these things are looking pretty similar. So let's find another comparison point. Go back up to copper, 29. Let's look at the density, 8.96 grams per cubic centimeter. Density equals 8.96 grams per cubic centimeter. That's pretty dense. For a reference, water is one gram per cubic centimeter. So copper is about uh, almost nine times as dense as water. Much, much heavier. Let's look at gold. Gold is 19.3. Gold has a density of 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter. So in some ways, these substances are very similar. They both have very similar melting points. They both conduct electricity really well, but one of them has a density, gold, that is much, much higher than that of copper. So if you were making electrical wires, you probably want to make electrical wires out of the substance that's not as heavy. All of our electrical wires would be more than twice as heavy if we used gold. So let's look at some extensive properties. Extensive properties, copper, um, it has a kind of like rust brown color. That's a, we all know the, co the color of like a nice shiny copper penny. Gold, um, gold, we name the color gold after gold. Um, it's gold, it's shiny. Copper is also shiny. Uh, these are things that you can observe. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, those are not extensive properties. Those are intensive properties. Silly me, see, even I get confused sometimes. Extensive property, again, mass, how much of it we have, um, the volume that it takes up, how much space is it in, um, the shape. Oftentimes, uh, copper you'll find as wires, coins. These are examples of different shapes you can find gold in. Uh, oftentimes, jewelry. Um, like earrings, rings, things like that. Gold is also used in dentistry for tooth crowns or caps, things like that. So those are properties that depend on how much of it you have, how much mass, the shape, the volume that it occupies, things like that. All right, so let's move on. We dwelled on that long enough. So I alluded to it earlier when I was talking about the phase changes going from a liquid to a solid but we often use the melting and boiling points of a substance as one of the easiest ways to categorize it because we have a lot of that data already on hand for us. So the, the big key to determining, differentiating between your states of matter is uh, how the particles behave. So in a solid, it does not change shape or volume. All of the atoms, all of the particles in the substance are all locked in place, like like Legos, in a, like Legos in a build. They're all locked in place. They're not going anywhere. In a liquid, liquids can change their shape, but they have constant volume. So think of like a bucket of marbles. Think of your atoms in like a water as a bucket of marbles. If you stick your hand into it, you can push the marbles out of the way. You can move them around. If you pour the bucket out, they'll spread out on the ground, but they're confined to their, to their space and they really do still stay compact together. Probably the hardest state of matter to conceptualize is the gas. And that is often because we can't see gases when we talk about them, but you're surrounded by gas constantly. The air you breathe, um, when you see a balloon going down the street, the pockets in your sneakers, they're all full of gas. And what gas particles are doing is they're not connected to each other at all. Gas particles are very high energy. 
and they just fly around bouncing off of each other and the and um, the walls of whatever container they're in. So if you have a balloon of helium, the helium is buzzing around that balloon and filling up the space of that balloon. If you pop that balloon, those helium particles will not stay in the shape of that balloon. They will just spread out throughout the atmosphere, throughout the room that they're in. If you're outside, they'll just spread out into the atmosphere. So um, each one of these substances, while they behave very differently, can still be the same substance. So water is the easiest example to think of this in. If you take water and you put it in the freezer, you get ice cubes, rigid structures that don't change their shape or volume. If you take water out of the freezer, you can pour it into a cup, you can pour it on the ground, it will flow out in a puddle. You can put it from one cup in a different cup and it will change its shape, but it will still have the same volume. When you put water on the stove and you add heat to it, it'll turn into a steam and that water vapor will fly out of the pot, fly around the room and leave the pot. And if you leave a pot on the stove long enough, all of the water will turn into a gas and dissipate out into the air. Lastly, the last thing we're going to do when we describe physical changes is we're going to decide whether these changes are reversible or irreversible. Reversible meaning that we can make the change go backwards. Irreversible meaning we really can't make that change go backwards. So, for instance, um, a reversible change, an example of a reversible change right from the previous slide, melting. If you take an ice cube out of the freezer and you let it melt, it will go back to a liquid. But if you put it back in the freezer, it will freeze again. So, melting, freezing, and boiling are all reversible changes. We can put something into a gas phase, bring it back to a liquid, put something from a liquid to a solid, bring it back to a liquid. Um, and not actually change what the substance is. And if you're having trouble thinking about that, again, think about water. Water can go from ice to liquid to gas, solid, liquid, gas, and back and forth an infinite, infinite number of times. So an irreversible change is a change that we can't put back. Um, we can't put back without some kind of chemical process. So an example of an irreversible change is like smashing, powdering. Um, this is a good example. Um, I used to have a cat and my cat got sick. So I needed to give my cat pills and my cat hated taking the pills. It was impossible to get my cat to take the pills. So what I did was I put the pills into a little mortar and I crushed them. I crushed them into powder and then I sprinkled the pills over the cat's food and the cat ate the food and ate the pills. This is an irreversible change because once I crushed those pills into a powder, there was no way I was getting that powder back into a pill shape. I had changed its, its shape and its structure. It was still medicine. It still went into the food and it still went into the cat and did its job, but I, uh, I smashed it and I powdered it down to the point where I was not gonna be able to put it back into that, um, that pill shape. So hopefully, this is just the examples that I'm going to give you. Hopefully, you guys can come up with some more for yourselves. Um, that's the end of my little lecture. What I need you to do is complete these exit ticket questions and submit this assignment for me, and I'll grade it and get it back to you as quickly as I can. Um, if you have any questions, I will see you in office hours or in person. All right, guys. Have a good one.